Welcome, welcome everybody. My name's Hilary Horrocks and I'm the delegate to the Edinburgh Trade Union Council from the Edinburgh National Union of Journalists branch. Um, we're going to start um, by showing the short video um, which um, Edinburgh TUC made. Uh, it was made by Craig McLean and Scott MacDonald actually last year to commemorate the third anniversary of Grenfell. Um, the video uses many of Craig's photos of the silent vigils that we held in Edinburgh city centre on the first two anniversaries of the fire. Edinburgh TUC has commemorated the last two anniversaries of the Grenfell tragedy with a silent vigil in the city centre. This year it's not been possible to do this, so we put together a selection of reflections from these events and send our warmest greetings and solidarity on this sad day. Justice for Grenfell, we will not forget. The Grenfell disaster was one of the defining moments of our times, and it's one the government is yet to learn its lessons from. However, we must know that this was not just a tragedy. It was not an accident. It was a crime. 72 lives were lost, and many more were displaced, and they're still in temporary accommodation. This ripped through the hearts of families and communities that cannot begin to heal until there is widespread recognition that this was the result of systematic neglect by those we have elected to protect us. The Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea is one of the richest in the City of London, yet it opted to save over £293,000 on cladding. In addition, the Coalition Government's destruction of red tape enabled contractors to cut corners and prioritise profit over safety. This illustrates what's happened when housing is treated as a commodity and the lives of the poor are treated with contempt. Residents of Grenfell repeatedly and explicitly voiced their concerns over the building's safety, yet these voices were ignored and then silenced by harassment and then gagging orders. Three years later and there has been little progress. Phase one of the inquiry was buried under Brexit coverage last year and many of those forced from their homes remain in to be adequately rehoused despite the borough's commission of multi-million pound luxury flats. The trauma experienced by those bereaved and forced from their homes demands justice. This demand for justice is echoed in those from tenants who remain in unsafe, insecure and unsanitary housing. No time has this been more evident than now, where up to 2 million people are on the precipice of homelessness as a result of arrears accrued during the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, one in five tenants have reported that they have gone without food for at least a day in order to pay their rent. The housing system is broken and desperately needs to be fixed. Together, organised, unionised, we can and we must demand housing justice from the ground up. Block by block, street by street, we can and we will. Hi, I'm Denise Christie, Regional Secretary for the FBU here in Scotland. 14th of June 2017 will be marked in history, a date of nightmare death and destruction. 72 people dead and many injured, and a Tory government which has left behind a trail of broken promises. Three years on from Grenfell, and the building safety crisis is nowhere near being resolved. It's disgraceful that three years since the fire, nobody has been brought to justice. It's disgraceful that firefighters have been criticised at the Grenfell Tower inquiry or the business people and politicians who made the wrong decisions have barely been held to account so far. And it's disgraceful that one in five firefighter jobs have been cut over the last decade due to austerity. We have thousands of families living in deadly homes. We have a Tory government that has neither taken responsibility nor held building owners accountable. And it's only a matter of time before the next disaster. So today, on the third year anniversary, the FBU stands in solidarity with the bereaved, the survivors, and the residents of Grenfell Tower. We have marched on every silent walk since the fire and we will continue that solidarity until the Grenfell Tower inquiry nails those at the top, including senior ministers. We will keep fighting for changes in fire safety regulation and we will continue 
to stand with people everywhere campaigning for safe homes. We remember all the victims of Grenfell and their loved ones, and today must be about them, and the future must be about ensuring everybody lives in a safe home and that we have justice for Grenfell. Never again. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sophia. Um, I'd now like to ask um, Mary Alexander, who's who featured in the video. She's Deputy Regional Secretary of UNITE and um, she's a, a Scottish TUC General Council member. And she's just going to say a few introductory words. Um, if you could unmute yourself, Mary. Great. Yeah, thanks. It's hard to believe it's coming up for four years since the horror of the 14th of June 2017, when 72 residents of Grenfell Tower lost their lives because of the gross negligence, corruption and inhumanity of a system that puts crony capitalism first. Everyone responsible for the despicable decisions that led to the loss of life has run for cover in the intervening years with the Justice for Grenfell campaign and Grenfell Tower Trust and other campaigning groups being left to carry the baton of justice for the bereaved, their relations and survivors. Instead of support, the UK government and local council at Kensington and Chelsea appear to have dragged their heels at every turn from rehousing survivors and their families to moving the location of the inquiry, to refusing the request for a community panel until they were shamed into it by a massive petition, 
to appointing inappropriate inquiry members and leaders, which campaigners have had to challenge at every step of the way. The public inquiry has revealed the depth of the scandal and culture of corruption, where the companies who made the cladding deliberately deceived the regulators who didn't do the job in carrying out sufficient checks. And still the government is slow to carry out the necessary work to make the estimated 300 odd residential and publicly owned buildings safe, which have combustible cladding. Four years on, it's disgraceful that very little has been done. The much vaunted fire safety bill, which was passed in April this year, doesn't take into account financial protection for leaseholders. Five times MPs rejected attempts to include financial support for leaseholders facing ruinous costs to replace the inflammable cladding. I'm sure our speakers will say more in terms of the updates to the campaign. But I just wanted to reiterate, as we've heard from the contributions um, already, that your struggle is our struggle. And whilst we can't come together to get physically again this year in Edinburgh to publicly demonstrate our outrage and solidarity with the bereaved, their families and the survivors, we can pledge our continuing solidarity and support in your fight for justice. We will not forget until those responsible are brought to justice. Thanks. Thanks very much, Mary. That's great. Um, right, yeah, as you say, our speakers tonight are going to share their own experiences of the fire and its aftermath. And we are really grateful to them for coming to speak about something that must still be very raw and painful. Um, I'd like, can you, I ask everyone if you have any questions to put them in the chat and hopefully um, after the speakers, there'll be time for um, some contributions from the audience. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Nabil Shukair. Um, Nabil is a former bus driver and mechanic Four years ago, Nabil lost six of his family members in the Grenfell fire. He is a founding member of the Grenfell Tower Trust. So away you go, Nabil. Can you unmute yourself? Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to start with saying thank you very much for the ongoing support that you have shown and continue to show. Um, this was the first time I saw the clip and I was, I'm very touched with it. Um, this is an ongoing fight and four years on, it seems like as if it was only today it happened. An anniversary comes once a year to, to me and many other uh, next of kin families. An anniversary feels like every day. And we have to keep remembering and living uh, this pain and agony and what we have to go through and what we have to fight for in order to get justice, to remember the innocent people that lost their lives, that should have never lost their lives. And the ongoing... Uh, support that we have to try and help others for example people that are living with dangerous cladding um, still on their buildings and uh, we want that removed ASAP because we know well, what our families went through we don't want their families to go through and to continue the suffering and the pain of what we've having to go through so we will be continuing lobbying, visiting the Prime Minister. In fact, uh, now that COVID is coming to, shall I say, a so-called end, or they cannot use um, COVID as an excuse not to be able to visit or meet, We'll be, we will be meeting with the Prime Minister to turn around and ask him what's going on with this cladding. What's going on? Why have you not 
remove it since it's been four years. Um, since rainfall, many fires have happened. Quite a few where they've gone from from floor to floor. But we can't have another grandfall happen, so we will continue to make sure that uh, this is really looked into and taken more serious. It cannot be any more profit. Uh, before health and safety, health and safety of everybody is a priority and must be a priority and we will continue to fight this. Coming down to prosecution, four years on, uh, well, I don't have my much faith of the inquiry um, because we've seen uh, Mr Morbick um, come up with a recommendation which the government has still not yet recommended or implemented as well. Uh, Yvette might talk about even more. Um, so, talking about the memorial, um, we are now in the stage where we're starting to get advice from people what they would like to see in place of the tower. And um, this is going to be a very challenging time. Um, because it's a very sensitive matter, as you can understand, and may know that 22 people's lives were lost, and it's very involves many families. So, Nabil, Nabil, I'm sorry, your your sound is breaking up a bit. Maybe if you get sorry, is that any better? Yes, I think so. Sorry, sorry on you go. Okay, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so as we know now, the memorial is due um, and taking place and what people want to see in place of the tower or, you know, it's a very sensitive matter where it involves many families um, having and residents and survivors also having their view. Um, so that is taking place as we are speaking. And uh, as you know, uh, there won't be no prosecution until the end of the inquiry, you know. Well, you know, I always turned around and said they should put the inquiry in hold and prosecute these people because we really want to see these people being prosecuted so that there can be a change, you know. But obviously, to me, it feels like uh, the police are um, waiting or trying to find out any information um, in order to make sure they get what they get is right and not wrong. You know, um, they've made some mistakes in the past where uh, the inquiry revealed some notebooks that uh, was not disclosed to the police. And that was a bit of a mess that police had to answer and they, did, they could, didn't have an answer for. Uh, but yet it came into the inquiry, but it didn't come into the police hands, and it came into the police hands a lot after. And when families found that out, they were very upset. So you know, it's um, it's a uh, it's one of those situations where we're having to fight every corner, and every corner there is a challenge, and we have to look at each challenge. Uh, in what we can do and what we can, how we can make and make some changes. And one of the challenges that we had just recently was to get a petition uh, done. And then that petition, it was to ask uh, the inquiry to look into the role of institutional discrimination in the Grenfell Tower. That was one very hard, hard challenge because every time we put in a petition, they refused it, they came back with this and they used the excuse that there's an inquiry going on and we can't do it and blah, blah, blah. Well, finally, after uh, I can give you some good positive news, which is after so many fights and so many challenge, 
we managed to get the petition put through, uh, which Yvette will probably mention to you more about. Uh, it's on their, so uh, on their social media. And she will let you know about it. Uh, you can check. And uh, we ask everyone to sign up to, for it because it could be another law changing uh, where the government will have to look into it and it will help other people tomorrow in... Uh, and to, if, if they will be discriminated, we can maybe make another law from that. So it will lead to many other places. Um, I just want to carry on and say thank you and give everyone a chance and I'll answer any questions what everyone wants to ask. Thank you very much. Great, Nabi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Yvette Williams, a co-founder of Justice for Grenfell, which was set up immediately after the fire in the absence of any help from either local or national government. Yvette was a founding member of Operation Black Vote and was head of equality and diversity for the Crown Prosecution Service in London for 14 years. She's a member of the TUC Race Task Force and she was recently appointed as a governor of Ruskin College, Oxford. Yvette. Where are you, Yvette? Um, I'm here. I'm really sorry. My internet's just cut out, so I'm having to work from my phone. OK. Um, so um, I didn't hear what you said to introduce me. Anyway, um, I did hear the end of Nabil, um, and I mean, firstly, I just kind of want to say um, it's heartbreaking um, to hear Nabil's um, four-year journey along with other bereaved families. Um, and, you know, they go through this daily, as he said. Um, and it's shocking that we're living in, you know, the fifth richest country in the world um, where we have people having to go through this to fight for justice. Um, where are we four years on? Well, um, there's been no arrest. As others have said, thousands of people are still living in dangerous buildings. Only four of the inquiry recommendations from phase one have been implemented. We've had to force them to look at disability discrimination. Um, and we're still fighting to get issues of race and class included in the terms of reference. So those are the things I'm going to talk about this evening. Um, so at the beginning, straight after the fire, um, we were told that there was a criminal investigation happening. Um, and then halfway through phase one, they say, actually, the criminal investigation will be concluded at the end of phase two of the inquiry. Um, and we're seeing some really awful stuff, especially in this last module, um, happening, especially around the corporates. Um, where we're just thinking, actually, when these people leave the inquiry, they should be put in handcuffs and led away. Because um, we can certainly see the criminality. And the first time that really comes to light for us is at the beginning of phase two. Um, on the second day, it was suddenly stopped. And everyone was told that the corporates were putting in an application to the Attorney General for immunity from the oral evidence that they gave to the inquiry and that immunity was granted to them um, and that's quite poignant at the moment because if we look at what's recently happened in the Hillsborough verdict where you get you know corrupt police amending their statements um, to make their fellow officers not to look as bad um, and then getting off with it, where a judge says, actually, it was okay for them to um, amend their statements because it wasn't for a court of law. It was actually for an inquiry 
and I'm going to speak more about inquiries at the end, but, you know, using Hillsborough as, a, as an example, um, it seems to be that inquiries are just used basically to, and remember, um, Hillsborough had to wait, I think it was the best part of a decade for an inquiry in the first place. And you've got people like Orgreave, who are still waiting for an inquiry since 1984. So, who gets an inquiry and who doesn't is another question that we need to ask. Um, but, you know, the delay process actually just kind of kicks, um, kicks the issue and time for change and accountability and getting to the truth, into the long grass. Um, in terms of people still living in buildings, so since... Um, since Grenfell, there have been about six fires um, with the same issue around the combustible materials on the building. Um, before La the Lackanor House fire in Campbell One in 2009, there'd been five previous fires leading up to that. Now, six people died um, at Lackanor House, um, but the investigation didn't quite come down hard enough that cladding was a direct cause. Um, and actually the government sat on the recommendations and we know now that perhaps if they didn't do that, Grenfell will never have happened. In terms of the materials, we don't know why they're for sale in the first place on any block, to be put on any block at any height. Um, they're trying to say only on um, buildings over 18 feet. You know, why are these on the market? The material, the cladding um, panels um, were actually passed um, as class, what they call class zero under the building regulations. Um, and this enabled the manufacturers um, of the cladding products to keep within the letter of the law and it allowed them to sell a cheaper material. Um, what we need to know is what we've worked out is um, the cash savings on the Grenfell refurbishment on the cladding um, was a saving of £126,000. So that works out at roughly £1,744 for each of the 72 victims. So to coin a phrase from Nelson Mandela when he came here in the 90s, do you know what I mean? Our lives are just cheap. The, this module of the inquiry has also exposed a wretched industry culture um, where, um, you know, literally they're just waiting for um, another thing to happen. You know, we've seen things like, you know, falsified fire certificates, we've had falsified fire tests, you know, we've had give a job to your mate, have a free lunch, um, all those sorts of things um, going on. And they're blatantly happy to say this, um, you know, on the stand, knowing that it won't be used as part of their as part of any prosecution, if any prosecution happens. But we're also saying that merely replacing cladding and updating the regulations is still not enough. The whole of that culture has to change. You know, we've even found things out like, you know, donations to the Tory party being given. Um, you know, safety has to come first now. Um, it has to be more than profit. And if Grenfell's not the catalyst, then um, I really don't know what will be. Um, and I know kind of watching the inquiry day by day, um, just, it's just like, it's just hidden in plain sight. Um, and everyone's ignoring it. We've managed to get disability discrimination discussed in this module, um, although they still won't put in issues of race and class, but almost half of those who died in the Grenfell fire were disabled people or, or children. Um, and 41% of those with a disability in the who lived in the tower died on that night. Um, there were no personal 
um, evacuation plans in place. Um, so they couldn't self-evacuate even if they wanted to. Um, yesterday, the government has now issued a consultation on um, who takes responsibility in buildings for um, personal evacuation plans. But again, they're very vague. Um, they're very loose. There's no written sanctions about what will happen if you don't kind of have personal evacuation plans for your tenants. Um, so they're just kind of words in the wind, really. Um, in terms of race, um, we always say, look at the people that died and then tell us that race has nothing to do with it. But they've refused to put that into, um, into the terms of reference. Um, and we're just like, you know, unless you face the truth, unless you look at social equality and racism in terms of how it impacts our lives every day, um, then if you continue to exclude it, then you'll miss an opportunity really um, to address the situation and make real change about the social inequalities that are happening in our society. And Nabil has just put out a petition. Um, I will um, circulate it again, demanding that um, race and class are put into the terms of reference and to try and force the inquiry to address that. Um, in terms of the inquiry, um, and this is where we have a serious issue, um, it's it, only four of the um, phase one, I think there were 46, 36 um, recommendations made in phase one. Only four of those inquiry recommendations have been implemented. And those have been actually by the fire service. Um, the fire service who they scapegoated at phase one, might I add. Um, so, Inquiries seem to have become the favoured route for governments when they're addressing kind of um, culpability. They're hugely expensive. They're usually plagued with delays. Um, and let's be reminded that justice delayed is justice denied. Um, but furthermore, inquiries have no legal recourse. And as it stands, governments do not have to act or implement any inquiry findings or um, recommendations. And why that's crucial for us is, is because if they'd have done that with the Lacknell House fire, perhaps the fire at Grenfell may never have happened. What we've seen also in terms of recommendations, um, the Labour, the opposition put forward um, an amendment to the fire safety bill that has been kicked backwards and forwards from the House of Commons to the House of Lords with the Tories consistently voting against it. But, um, you know, Kia, for all his faults, not fun, um, has, um, he did, he did listen and he did push forward an amendment to the fire safety bill that would include implementing all of the recommendations from the, um, from phase one and it was turned down. So at the moment we've joined with um, the Haldane Society um, they're a bunch of socialist lawyers um, looking at the purpose of inquiries, why they use, why some people get one, why are they used instead of criminal investigation, as Nabil alluded to earlier. Um, and, um, you know, they're hugely expensive. They cost so much money. Um, and at the end, nothing really happens. Um, the, and the one in, good inquiry where it did happen in terms of Stephen Lawrence inquiry and the whole thing about institutional racism was watered down um, within a, well, within a decade, two years after they got rid of the Commission for Racial Equality, you know, six years after they were amending the Equality Act, they formed the Equality um, and Human Rights Commission that kind of just watered everything down um, so please look out for, we're running a petition on, over the anniversary, um, asking for it, for it to be made, a, to, well, to review 
the 2005 Inquiries Act and to make it a legal requirement for a government to implement recommendations and findings from inquiries. Um, so that's where we are. Um, and I will get that stuff to you. It'd be brilliant if you can put it out online, um, both of the petitions out online um, for us. Um, I just want to say at the end that um, for us, the unions have been stalwart um, in supporting us. Um, and so I'd like to say a big thank you um, to Edinburgh Trade Councils for all you've done. Um, in supporting us um, and let's hope um, that we're not having a meeting of this nature in four years time um, that may coincide with an election actually so um, but yeah absolutely dreadful this is this should be the 14th of June this year should be a day of national disgrace really it's a disgrace it's a real indictment on our government to let 72 precious souls go and four years on, I've not done nothing about that to save further human life. So thank you for inviting me here today. Thank you, thank you very much Yvette. Thank you. Um, perhaps you could, Yvette, I don't know if you could put a link to the um, Justice for Grenfell website and possibly to the, the, the link for don donations. Okay. I'm going to try and log back on. Um, so if you see me coming in on um, my computer. We'll admit you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm going to get in. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'll do that now. Right. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay, our next speaker, uh, welcome to Denise Christie. She's the Scottish Secretary of the Fire Brigade. <laughs> Okay. Um, Yvette, you have to mute yourself. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yes, Denise is um, the Scottish Secretary of the Fire Brigades Union. She's been a firefighter fighter for 25 years and was based at Tollcross Fire Station in Edinburgh before she was elected as the FBU's Scottish Regional Secretary. Denise is going to give an update on the Grenfell Tower inquiry that's been provided by the FBU head office. But she says she's, she's not directly involved in the inquiry, so she might not be able to answer all the questions that come up, but she can certainly um, take the questions and provide feedback via Edinburgh TUC following the meeting. Okay, take it away, Denise. Thanks, Hilary, and, and, and thanks to the previous two speakers. It really is such an emotional um, subject, Grenfell, isn't it? And, and, and hearing that, you know, hearing the speakers there and, you know, specifically Nabil, whose families um, tragically were, were killed in Grenfell, just want to pass on the, the solidarity from the Fire Brigade Union. Um, and trade unions, we this is absolutely campaigns that we should be involved in. It's not just about campaigns that impact on our members' terms and conditions or pay, etc. It's the wider campaigns that the movement, the trade union movement, absolutely have to be involved in. And I am proud of the Fire Brigade Union and, you know, we have never uh, let go of supporting uh, Justice for Grenfell. So I will give a very, very brief update and, and the briefing that I have had is from our FBU head office. We have got a team that has been working on the, the Grenfell Tower inquiry. Um, we have put quite a bit of resources in to support in the, the campaign round about that. And it's not possible to quantify the impact that the loss of life and devastation caused by the fire at Grenfell on the 14th of June 2017 is having and will have in years to come. 72 people lost their lives and their homes in one of the richest places in the world. And they lost their lives because a decision was made to improve the look of the tower block in which they lived as cheaply as possible and whilst almost completely overlooking the fire risks that would arise in the construction project. And at least 250 firefighters and 60 fire appliances attended that fire. Firefighters and emergency fire control staff worked all night 
to rescue people and put out the fire. And they have all suffered from the physical and mental effects of that night and all wish for justice for the bereaved, the survivors and the residents. In four years since the Grenfell Tower Inquiry, the public inquiry into how it came to be so devastating will not be concluded until at least 2022. Meanwhile, the fire has revealed a hidden crisis in fire and building safety regulation. And that's resulted in hundreds of thousands of people living in buildings with flamm flammable facades and other serious fire safety defects. And the Grenfell Tower inquiry is divided into two parts. Phase one, that concluded with the publication of a report by the inquiry chair, Sir, Sir Martin Moorbeck, in October 2019, and examined the night of the fire and heard the testimony of firefighters, chief fire officers, residents, and those involved in the aftermath of the fire. And phase two, that examined the causes of the fire began in earnest in January 2020, but has been marred by disruptions. Firstly, it was suspended for some weeks while the Attorney General considered a request by some of the corporations involved in the refurbishment, including Kensington and Chelsea Tenant Management Organization, for a guarantee that the evidence they would give would not be used to further a criminal prosecution against them. And shortly after, an undertaking was granted and the hearings restarted. The inquiry had to be called off again because of the national COVID-19 lockdown. The second phase of the inquiry is divided into eight modules that examine different categories of evidence. And the evidence so far in phase two has exposed a pattern of corporate profit seeking and woefully inadequate health and safety scrutiny by public bodies. And the evidence given by the key companies involved in the refurbishment, such as Ryden, the project managers, Studio E, the architects, and Harley, the cladding designers, revealed the total absence of any consideration of fire safety and the selection and installation of the materials used to clad the tower. Again and again, when asked about the regulations that govern fire safety in external walls, the witnesses expressed either ignorance, sketchy knowledge, confusion, or the assumption that it was the responsibility of another company in the supply chain. And the evidence has been clear. Instead of being a priority, fire safety was barely an afterthought for those refurbishing the tower, the manufacturers. Next came the evidence from the companies who manufactured materials in the rain screen cladding system used on the tower that was found to be entirely non-compliant with building regulations. This has been nothing short of horrifying, with fire safety re relegated to the bottom of the pile. The big players in the, in the cladding industry were able to push their dangerous products into the market. Celotex and Kingspan, the manufacturers of the combustible insulation used behind the ACM cladding, were both engaged in a game of falsifying fire tests and duping the organisations that certify the safety of construction products in order to access the lucrative high-rise market in the UK. Celotex falsified the fire tests of its RS5000 insulation boards by using fire retardants and obtained approval from building control bodies under false pretenses. Kingspan threatened to sue Britain's biggest building control body, the National House Building Council, when it raised doubts about the suitability of its plastic foam insulation, K15, on buildings over 18 metres. Just weeks after the fire, Rather than seek to learn lessons and accept responsibility, Kingspan engaged in PR firms to lobby the government and set up rigged tests on non-combustible materials to argue that they were no safer than its K-15. Arconic, the manufacturer of, of now-banned ACM PE cladding panels, 
knew its product was highly flammable and knowingly promoted its sale in the UK, taking advantage of our weaker regulatory regime. Key witnesses from Arconic refused to attend the inquiry. Arconic, Kingspan and Celotex are all still blaming each other. And since April 2021, the Grenfell Tower inquiry has been hearing evidence from former residents of the tower and employers of the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea Council and the Tenants Management Organisation in relation to how residents' complaints were dealt with and how the tower was maintained before the fire. Module three hearings have revealed how residents' complaints and concerns regarding the fire safety risks, doors, and quality of the workmanship during the refurbishment of the tower between 2014 and 2016 were systematically ignored by the TMO as it sought to save money on its work to improve the appearance of the building. Cost cutting by the Royal Borough of Kensington Council and the TMO was a constant thread in the decision making around the refurbishment of the tower. Indeed, austerity cuts had a different impact, a direct impact on the ability of the council's building control inspector, John Hoban, to give the project the attention it deserved. In 2013, the Royal Borough of Kensington underwent restructuring that left Mr. Hoban covering the work of three members of staff with over 130 projects to oversee. He resigned in 2017 just before the fire and explained, I resigned because I had enough. I wasn't able to do the job how I was taught to do it. It was affecting my health and I just didn't want to work there anymore. Under these conditions, the unprofessional profit seeking and at times sinister activities of the companies refurbishing the tower were inadequately scrutinized and fell under the radar. And as a core participant, the Fire Brigade Union makes submissions and provides evidence to the Grenfell Tower Inquiry. In our opening submission to Module 3, we highlighted a culture within the RBKC and the TMO that ignored fire safety warnings. The evidence has shown that during the, during the refurbishment period, there were many correct and significant interventions by fire safety officers at the London Fire Brigade and by residents, but these were not seen, but these were seen as a hurdle to get over. A paperwork problem to close out and the potential to life was not evaluated by the owners of Grenfell Tower. And the shocking accounts from those involved in refurbishing Grenfell give strength to the position the FBU has held from the start that fire safety cannot be left to the free market, but needs proper regulation and proper resourcing. And we continue to make those arguments today and actively participate in the inquiry. An inquiry is not due to conclude until the end of 2022, more than five years after the fire, alongside the bereaved survivors and residents, and as a result of the dire evidence on building safety here so far, we are calling on the inquiry chair to report his findings to the prime minister as soon as possible in order to ensure that lessons learned are acted upon now. And the FBU maintains that the inquiry should be a turning point in fire safety. Fire Safety Act in response to the fire, the Westminster government set up a vast number of consultations and introduced two new bills. The Fire Safety Bill and the Building Safety Bill. The Fire Safety Bill was introduced on the 19th of March 2020, underwent a series of attempted amendments in the House of Lords and became an act on the 29th of April 2021. The most significant amendment sought to guarantee that owners could not pass on the costs of building safety works onto leaseholders, but this was rejected after many attempts. And as a result, the Act leaves thousands of leaseholders facing huge costs to pay for safety work on their buildings. It's an astonishing outcome. 72 people lost their lives 
in a non-compliant high-rise building and four years later, many thousands of people in similar non-compliant buildings are expected to pay the price of living in unsafe homes. And on July, 20th of July, 2020, the Westminster government published its draft building safety bill for pre-legislative scrutiny. And this was followed by an inquiry by the House and Communities and Local Government Committee into the draft bill. In our submission to the HCLG committee, we argued that the building safety bill does create a more robust regulatory regime for high risk homes and some other sleeping accommodation. And the Hackett Review made a strong case for applying aspects of health and safety at work regulation and best practice from the health and safety executive to matters of building safety. As such, the FBU supported the direction and key changes in the building safety bill, although the union still had some significant questions and concerns. And the FBU argued the height condition of 11 metres or four storeys would be a safer threshold for the new regime regulation high-risk residential buildings. The FBU also raised the alarm about the continued involvement of private sector firms in regulation. And the FBU has consistently argued for decades that the fundamental shift from the 1980s onwards towards deregulation, privatisation and contracting out is crucial to understanding what went wrong at Grenfell Tower and continues to hamper building safety. And within Scotland, in Scotland, a change to building regulations in 2005 made it mandatory for builders to ensure that any external cladding inhibited fire spreading. And those new regulations were introduced following a fatal fire in a Scottish tower block at Garnet Court in Ayrshire in 1999. And the fire led to a revisiting of regulations in Scotland. The Building Scotland Act 2003 introduced the Building Scotland Act regulations 2004, which came into force in May 2005. And it legislated that all cladding was used in high-rise dwellings had to be non-combustible. It contains a mandatory regulation. Every building must be designed and constructed in such a way that in the event of an outbreak of fire within the building or from an external source, the spread of fire on the external walls of the building is inhibited. And following the Grenfell fire, Scottish Government stated no local authority or housing association, high rises in Scotland, used the cladding installed on Grenfell Tower. And by contrast, four years after Grenfell in England, there are still 4,800 homes in the social sector with ACM cladding yet to be remedied and 12,400 homes in the private sector. And these figures are for ACM cladding, like the one found on Grenfell. Yet it is known that there are other highly flammable cladding systems that may even be more widespread. And the FBU has long warned about the dangers of combustible materials, on the external walls of high rise residential buildings. And today, in light of the evidence from the Grenfell Tower fire and from other fire incidents in the UK and internationally, the union would go further and seek some more comprehensive ban on combustible materials on the external walls of buildings, especially in high rise buildings. And I'll finish off with this, that this is why it's so important that trade unions get involved in these campaigns, because our members are at the co-face, are at the front face of some of these um, issues that are being raised. It's firefighters that have got fire safety qualifications. It's firefighters that experience these issues every single day. And we are the experts and, and our voices should be listened to. Um, so thanks again for inviting the FBU. Grenfell, Grenfell community residents and the bereaved will always have our support and solidarity and we will keep on fighting until we get justice for Grenfell. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Denise. Um, our last two speakers are from um, Living Rent, the Scottish Tenants Union, 
Living Rent is a, a mass membership organisation of low and middle income renters fighting together to win concrete improvements to tenants' daily, daily lives and to put political and economic power back where it belongs in the hands of ordinary people. Living Rent has collaborated with the Edinburgh TUC every year to commemorate the Grenfell anniversary. So um, welcome Bryce and Caroline. Can I, I can give you five minutes each. So which of you wants to go first? With his first. Okay. Caroline, can you unmute yourself, Caroline? No problem. On you go. As introduced, my name is Caroline and I am with Living Rent. I live in New House in Edinburgh and that's the branch that I, I am deal with the most. So four years ago, I, like many others, watched in horror as Grenfell Tower burned live on the news. I was sitting in my flat in a high rise, texting my sister, hoping that everyone got out safely. It quickly became apparent that this was not the case. Over the next few days, the true horror of the fire was revealed. 72 dead and dozens more injured. The nation was rightly outraged. How in a country apparently stifled by health and safety protocols could so many people die in a fire? The initial response from the Westminster and Holyrood governments was swift. Independent reviews and safety checks were set up and carried out to make sure that a tragedy like this could never happen again. In Edinburgh, high-rise tenants received a flurry of leaflets assuring the residents that our homes were safe and that an incident like Grenfell could never happen here. But this urgency rapidly dissipated and has continued to do so with each of the four years since the entirely avoidable disaster. With the inquiry ongoing, companies and local authorities play hot potato in an effort to obscure their profiteering and negligence that led directly to the 72 deaths. And for the victims and the families who lost loved ones that night, justice remains a distant prospect. As a high-rise tenant in New House, Edinburgh, I have witnessed firsthand how the City of Edinburgh Council has spent four years acting with complacency and disregard for tenant concern for fire safety in their homes. A few months ago, there was a fire in one of the blocks neighbouring my own. The residents were left to self-evacuate the building and thankfully the fire was quickly extinguished. In a local development meeting that I attended shortly afterwards, the council staff were incredulous that the residents had evacuated the block over such a small contained fire. They appeared amused and held nothing but contempt and condescension for the tenants involved. It was immediately apparent that none of these staff lived in a high rise. When I explained the nervousness and trepidation that high rise residents have towards fires since Grenfell, they seemed shocked that their tenants felt unsafe. It had clearly never occurred to them that even though we don't have cladding on our blocks, we feel unsafe largely due to the lack of trust residents have in the council. Reading the published reports about the inquiry and how the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea Council treated the residents of Grenfell as a nuisance or a problem for raising concerns around health and safety prior to the fire mirrored our experiences in New House. Tenants on their own and through living rent have been fobbed off and given false promises related to urgent repairs required for safe and comfortable living conditions. Fire doors are damaged, windows are broken, panels in other doors are not compliant with fire safety. Yet these works are downgraded and delayed and residents are treated with contempt by those we depend on to keep our homes safe. There is a new development being proposed in your house. One of the conditions to be met by the council before a developer will take on this project is that the surrounding high rise blocks must be upgraded to look prettier on the outside and less like the dilapidated, crumbling, deprived housing that they are. This upgrade to the exterior is not for the residents' benefit, but rather to make sure that our proposed new, richer neighbours won't have their views offended by our existence, and of course, to improve the value of the properties being built. This is one of the main reasons given for the planning to be put on Grenfell, and residents in your house are worried that similar proposals are being made for our neighbourhood, I'm furious that such a suggestion is even being made in the wake of Grenfell. Residents strongly feel that repairing and updating the high rises inside and out would be better for the community as a whole, and that trying to hide us behind pretty exteriors and pretending we don't exist at the expense of our safety is unacceptable. 
high rises are still viewed by many as the domain of the poor and that you must be lesser if you live in one. Residents are viewed as schemies, jakies and junkies by individuals who live in wealthier parts of cities and towns, but this is demonstrably false. New House, where I live, has a terrible reputation and the only time the area is talked about is when there is crime or social disturbance. No mention is ever made of the strong sense of community that exists here. I'm not saying there isn't crime and social deprivation, but I know that if I have a problem, then I can call on my neighbours to help me and there will always be someone there for me. From testimonies of those in Grenfell, the residents also had this strong sense of community and the narrative in the media and reports needs to change so that the truth of high-rise living is represented accurately. Now, obviously, I have been speaking about my own personal experience about the area in which I live. However, speaking to people in living rent from all over Scotland, this fear, anger and misrepresentation is widespread. It doesn't matter if you are a tenant with a council, a housing association or a private landlord. We aren't asking for luxuries. We aren't asking for handouts. We just want affordable, comfortable homes that are safe. To say that Grenfell was a tragedy is to let the property profiteers and incompetent council officials who were responsible off the hook. It was a man-made disaster that cost the lives of 72 people. How many more people need to die needlessly in wholly preventable tragedies before local authorities and the governments in Holyrood and Westminster start to take the safety of residents seriously? Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Caroline. Bryce. Uh, just want to just uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Bryce. I'm from I'm from Live and Rent Fife. Um, and basically I'm here to talk more about the disabled and the and also the vulnerable who have been impacted by this. So the Grenfell Tower inquiry in, in, in the in the uh, sorry, the Grenfell Tower inquiry into the 2017 fire which killed over 72 people with, with, with which killed 72 people. Uh, lawyers within the inquiry stated that this is a landmark act of discrimination um, against the disabled and vulnerable people. As the Royal Borough of Kingston and Chelsea Council knew about the conditions of disabled people living in Grenfell Tower, but refused to provide them with evacuation plans and how some of them on upper floors with stay put fire policy the inquiry, um, the, which the inquiry to the Tower Fire has heard. A disabled resident um, who lived on the 23rd floor told the inquiry, uh, both the council and the tenant management organisation, that, that, that it had not been discussed for our safety with them. And, uh, and even when they became aware of their disability, and uh, they didn't even discuss any escape routes in the event of a fire. And, and unfortunately, uh, her husband died in that fire. And a disabled mother of two told the inquiry that she had to bump down her stairs on her bottom to escape the fire. Unbelievable. That's, that is just incredulous and, and absolutely disgraceful. As 52 out of 120 flats in the tower uh, housed disabled residents, 15 out of the 37 residents were classes vulnerable. Disabled people were killed. A TMO document listed only 10 disabled residents on the night of the fire. Other residents told the inquiry that the TMO never discussed the option of disabled residents moving to lower floors in the tower and making and or making reasonable adjustments to accommodate their impairments in the in the in their flats. This was a direct breach of equality at 2010. And many and many uh, many human rights and building regulations, just to name a few. The failure to facilitate the failure to facilitate the evacuation of disabled people has been called one of the two principal failures as as res as responsible persons by the council at TMO by Michael Mansfield QC, and the other um, and the other was the absence of of working fire doors on some of the flats. And this is not an isolated issue to Grenfell, just as what um, Caroline has alluded to in her, uh, and has spoken to in her speech. As when Scotland began lockdown in, in March 20, uh, um, on 23rd of March, we've heard from members housed in both private and social tenure properties in Glasgow, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, 
who just who, who tell us the same thing. Tenants have been left without essential safety critical repairs and services such as cleaning, vital life saving evacuation routes being cleared, and having and never and they've never and the, and they've never been carried out with just woolly responses or in some case silence falling on deaf ears. So where does the buck stop? Yet residents of Grenfell, as in Scotland, have been branded troublemakers by the TMO for highlighting valid safety concerns for years before the fire uh, before the fire told the inquiry. And the stay put policy was never satisfactory policy for a Grenfell fire. It was just a very convenient policy for a TMO because it meant they, had, they didn't have to do a single thing. A disabled resident who has lived on the ninth floor of the, of the tower told the inquiry he did not understand why there was no escape route suitable for disabled people as I could not run or walk through, uh, walk through the stairs as easily as other people. The council or the TMO did not give me any fire safety information. The council did not prepare any personal emergency evacuation plan for me as a disabled person on crutches to explain to me what I should do in the case of an emergency or in the case of a fire. I did not know what to do. So what we've learned, what what have we learned from that? Is that is that councils and this councils and TMOs are just routinely not adhering to the Equality Act 2010, nor the nor a nor the, nor even the code of practice which it, which it comes with that for associations as set out by the Human Rights and Equalities Commissioner. It is just they're not following the following the rules. And that is just absolute an abdication of responsibility and good governance by um, by res registered social landlords across the UK and and a wide and, and wider. So what and so as far as forty one percent of people who died were disabled, eighty seven of of them of the seventy two people who died in the fire were from black and ethnic minority backgrounds. These figures raise serious concerns about institutional racism and ableism. So, as Scotland's Tenants' Union, we are committed to fighting for affordable, adequate and safe housing for all tenants, wherever they are. We are committed to ensuring that tenants are heard and respected by their landlords, be that private or public, because tenants often understand and know, and know intimately where they live, just like what Caroline has, uh, has set out so eloquently in her speech. And only this will ensure such an atrocity will never be a blight on the community again. So I, will, I call for anyone on this call to join Scotland's Tenants Union, join Living Rent, and as a community, block by block, street by street, Living rent will win the lot, and we will and we will work together um, with communities, and we will we will fight this tooth and nail, and we stand in solidarity to the amazing uh, heroes of the fire service who have done absolutely amazingly well to actually fight fight this tooth and nail. We fully support you um, in this fight for justice and for and for and for absolute equality. Uh, about what's happened. So I just want to say a thank you very much for inviting us to speak to yourselves today and we'll be very more we'll be more than happy to take your take your questions. Thank you so much for listening to us. Great. Thanks very much, Bryce. Um, I'm conscious of the time. Um, we want to finish around eight o'clock, but I do want to try and get some comments and questions in. And um, I'm going to let in now um, Joanna Cherry, who's the MP for Edinburgh Southwest, who asked me before the meeting if she could say something. So away you go, Joanna. Thanks, Hilary. I'm not going to say very much because I think it's people sometimes a bit sick of listening to politicians. I think it's more important that people ask questions of our speakers in Living Rent. But I just wanted to say that I was privileged enough to meet some of the survivors of the fire and uh, 
families of the deceased at an event in the House of Commons uh, a couple of, of years ago on. And uh, it, it made a, a profound um, effect upon me. And uh, just a, a very brief reflection that, uh, picking up on what many of the speakers have said, I think is that, you know, the Grenfell Tower fire is very much the tale of a divided city and a divided community. Because what I would suggest is that if the Grenfell Tower had been full of wealthy or middle class, white, able bodied people, then I think the outcome of the disaster might have been rather different. People might have been rehoused more quickly. People's genuine concerns might have been taken more seriously. Um, but you know that doesn't really take us anywhere unless politicians commit to making sure that the findings of the inquiry are implemented and uh, that they're properly funded by central government. And also I think it's really important that we make sure that this doesn't end up like Hillsborough with nobody being held accountable. So um, for as long as I'm involved in politics, I'd give my commitment that I would want to make sure that somebody is held accountable for what happened. It, it won't bring back the dead and it, it won't heal people's pain, but it might mean that it won't happen again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna, thanks. Um, I want to pick up um, a few things that have come up in the chat and um, maybe if I could take three things and um, the speakers could respond. Um, there's something from Paul Woodard, who's I think been attending the inquiry regularly. And he says, from what I've seen of the inquiry, there is multiple negligence and incompetence across a multitude of areas that all contributed to the events. Upon completion, the blame might be spread so thin that no person has received sufficient due punishment. So that's something, there's a, a good question from Moira Samuels, who I think has been involved in the Grenfell campaigns. Um, Moira says, so how do you think the organized working class that is the trade unions, campaign groups and local communities, how do they make demands for change? And um, well, perhaps we take those two first and uh, then we can come back to a, a more specific question from Carmen. Um, who'd like to go first? Nabil? Okay, well, uh, when we, we want, if we're going to look at uh, the blameworthy, um, I really do, you know, believe um, they're going to get away with murder. Um, you know, a slap in the wrist is probably the most they'll get. And when I mean the slap of the wrist, it's probably hefty fines and nothing more, which is a shame, really, you know, and... Uh, I really don't see and believe in the police and uh, and what they're doing and just as much as in an inquiry, you know. Um, what can I say? I mean, it's uh, it's very sad, very, might seem a bit negative, but, you know, you got to be here and see what's happening and what's, what's going on and who you're dealing with. And it's just, um, it doesn't seem, you know, the, the law is so, it's so set that it's, it protects these MPs who literally have put it there to protect themselves, you know. And that's what, that's the reason why they're all going to get away with murder. I mean, you've got the inquiry set up by the government and the government set up the inquiry with its, picking its own people. You know, what kind of an independent inquiry is that? You know, it just that gives you one false hope there. You got the the police are paid by the government. Then, uh, you know, you can't see them prosecuting MPs. Well, I mean, uh, there's a law there already, you know, kind of like they, they put, they're protected in themselves. So, you know, it's so the law is so out of fashion that it really did, definitely needs to be changed. 
so people can really be prosecuted full out. But it's very going to be very, very, very faint that everyone's going to take the big, as they say, buck biting from here to here, you know. Uh, blame here and the blame there. They're all passing it on to each other. So everyone's going to get a little bit of blame here and a little bit of blame there. And it, it will be just, I don't think it will become very much of it, you know. Okay, thanks very much. Nabil, Yvette, do you want to say anything? Yeah, I just think I agree with Nabil. I think, um, you know, there needs to be um, structural change around the public inquiry um, act to ensure that, you know, we don't get outcomes like gross um, negligent manslaughter, um, where you kind of get a company who doesn't have to sit in the dock and may or may not get a fine because we haven't got a good history um, in England in terms of taking um, those kind of cases forward. So I think there is structural change. Um, in terms of the trade unions, I think um, if we think about the one set of voices um, that have been silenced in this whole process, it's actually the workers um, who put um, the combustible materials up in the first place. So why are they being kept quiet? Um, you know, who are they? You know, were they even employed under decent conditions? Because we know the sorts of people um, that they kind of employ um, in precarious employment on poor salaries, on poor wages and that to come and do kind of construction jobs. And if they were cutting money on um, cladding, they surely were cutting money on what they were paying the workers to come in and do the job. So that's actually a set of people um, that the unions can find. Um, I think, um, and I've had this discussion recently because I'm sitting on um, the TUC's um, race task force. Um, it is about the unions being stronger in communities, not just in the workplace. People do not live at work. However they're being treated in their communities, they take that into the workspace with them and it's a continuum of their experiences. And I think the next step for the unions is to be more active in their communities and listening to what people are saying. Yeah, you will learn things that you can bring back into the workplace around that. Um, but um, yeah, I think um, community, the, unions joining up in communities is important for me. I don't know if anybody saw um, Steve McQueen's Small Act series recently and they did um, a mangrove piece and I actually worked at the mangrove for a number of years and Althea LeConte Jones who's a member of the Black Panther Party she actually goes to a factory to speak to some Sikh workers and she says you know I'm a member of the Black um, Panther, but I'm telling you, you need to join a union um, in order to make conditions better for yourself. And I think, you know, it's really important that we do that kind of mashup now where actually government um, and, you know, we have got a Tory government and, you know, the trade unions have been weakened post Thatcher in the most disgusting way. And I think we need to kind of have that mashup and that united front. So when they see unions and community, they actually, we're just speaking as one, we're just kind of pushing that forward. And I think that is the change um, that we need to see. And I look forward to um, doing that. I'm just about to do a mashup with um, the Durham Gala and the Carnival. Durham has the biggest, the gala is the biggest in the, in the north. Carnival is the biggest in the south. Why aren't we taking the Unite Brass Band down to Carnival and why we're not bringing a steel band up from Carnival into the gala? So, because that's the last place they expect to see us. They don't expect to see the miners at Carnival and they don't expect to see the community of Notting Hill up at the gala. Um, so it's kind of the more we're in unity and we're doing that kind of coming together and speaking with one voice. I think we can do this. We need to fight, but I always say most importantly, we've got to fight to win. We have to fight to win and we can do this. Thanks, Yvette. Um, Denise, you did say something about this question, but do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, just on, on Paul's point, we talked about, you know, um, multiple negligence across lots of areas, but nobody's held accountable 
Well, people are being held accountable, but it's the wrong people. Firefighters were held accountable at the start of the inquiry, just like at Hillsborough when it was the fans, just like at Orgreave when it was the miners, and here now at Grenfell, it's the working class public servant firefighters at the start of this inquiry that are being held accountable. So people are being held accountable, but it's the wrong people that are being held accountable. And we know the reasons why it's the wrong people that's been held accountable because of the ideologic, you know, Tory politics that's absolutely embedded within uh, our society. And just on, on Moira's point um, on, on trade unions, I have just came from a two-day strategy day from the STUC General Council, and these are the actual points that we are discussing. We are discussing how relative trade unions can get involved in community campaigns and activism. We need to go into communities' backyards because they're not going to come into our backyard, so to speak. So we need to, we've got 550,000 trade unionists within Scotland and the trade union decline is going down and down and down. So we need to look to reinvent ourselves, reinvent our image, modernise ourselves, make us more relative to not just people within the communities and the issues that they've got within their work, pay terms and conditions, we need to be working with people like living rent, you know, housing associations, etc., and other communities and groups like Grenfell, and do that collaborative work. And do you know what event? Um, I've been at, um, as a daughter of a miner, I've been at the the gala for many many years, and I thought your suggestion was brilliant. Get the brass bands from the north down to Nottingham Carnival, and get the carnival up to the north, and let the communities you know, embed and, and, and work together. So a lot of work to be done, but I am absolutely optimistic of the future. Thanks. Thank you. Um, just thinking of the time, and there's one more question here, which is specifically, specifically for um, Living Rent and Denise. And it's from Carmen, who asks, uh, what would you say that are the most common health and safety issues in Edinburgh housing? Um, you could probably spend another hour and a half on this, but if you could be brief, please, and we could maybe have another meeting on it. Um, why, why don't you go first, Caroline? Um, for me, as someone who lives in your house and who specifically deals with the council, the biggest health and safety aspects, the problems that we have in this area and in other areas that the council is in charge of. Most of it is simply the fact that we're ignored. And I know that seems strange because ignore, ignore, being ignored doesn't necessarily mean health and safety issues, but it does because we try and call up a repair service in order to get work done on our homes because they're cold, they're covered in damp and black mold. The condensation is just literally running down the walls. We've got masonry crumbling. We've got fire doors that don't fit in the space they're supposed to. Lifts constantly out of order. Windows not opening properly. It really could go on and on and on. And it's being ignored. Our concerns are not taken seriously. We, we pay rent in order to be given a home that is safe and secure, that we can live in comfortably. And if we don't pay rent, you can bet the council will jump down your throat and will fight you tooth and nail to get every penny out of you and or evict you. But they're quite happy to let their aspects of the contract completely slide and not do the bare basics to keep houses safe, warm and dry. So that is the biggest issue is the fact that the council ignores us. And it's the same for private tenants. It's the same for housing associates as well. Until these people are held accountable when they're not doing things that they're supposed to be doing, they'll continue to get away with it. So that's something that Living Rent is really fighting for, is to make sure that it's not just one individual who's raising an issue, it's getting us all together so we can point out the systemic problems that are going on. And until we're taken seriously, and the issues that we raise are taken seriously, nothing will be done and our health and safety will always be secondary to penny pinching. Thanks, Caroline. Denise, do you have anything? Just very briefly, and, and I suppose this, this links to, you know, my members, firefighters that, that are on the ground doing those fire safety inspections. 
So UK wide, we've lost 11,000 firefighter jobs in the last 10 years. In Scotland, in the last seven years, since amalgamation of the eight fire services into one in 2013, we've lost 1,000 firefighter jobs. 25% of those jobs were fire safety enforcement officers. So if you reduce the capacity for firefighters to go out and do the inspections, fire safety doors, give advice that Bryce was talking about, you know, in the event of a fire, what do you do? Um, if you reduce the capacity within the professional environment of the fire service to give that advice, then of course there's going to be consequences. So again, it's a, again, it's a plea and it's a call for investment in our public services, specifically, you know, in relation to this and our fire and rescue service. If you deregulate, if you reduce the budgets, if, we, if you reduce the firefighter numbers, if you privatise the areas such as fire safety and fire inspection, but it's a profit market rather than for the communities, then that's a vicious circle that we're going to see, you know, impacts that are going to have in, in, on the back of Grenfell. And, and we, we can't have that. We need investment in public services, investment in the fire service, stop the deregulation and stop the privatisation. Thanks very much, Denise. Um, I just like, there's one more comment which I'd like to read out, but uh, I'd just like to say that um, this is one of many public meetings that Edinburgh Trade Union Council hope to organise in the future. Um, we've been organising regular um, public meetings on Zoom during the pandemic. So we hope to continue those when necessary, and but also expand and take advantage of having to be online um, to have um, public meetings on a variety of topics. So um, I think if if Des Des, who's the secretary of um, Edinburgh TUC, if you can put your email maybe in the chat, and um, that's a, an email for anyone who wants to be on a mailing list. Um, just email Des or, or leave your name in the chat before you go. Thanks very much. And um, here's a nice comment to end on from Sharon Robertson, who says, it's sad we have to fight for a basic human right, a safe home, lives have been lost and still put in jeopardy. We all need to be one voice, a big voice. More voices together makes our shout astronomical. We need to be heard and listened to. No more ignorance. So just like to conclude, thank you. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, especially to our powerful speakers. I think it's been a, a really good meeting, really, really instructive. And um, we'll conti continue, of course, to contribute in any way we can towards justice for Grenfell. So solidarity.